Thanks very much, Richard. Um, as Richard said, I'm part of the uh, Building Control and Taking Charge team in Dunleary, Rathdown, and I'm going to just talk about some of our experience in uh, doing inspections at CCC stage in Dunleary. So maybe just to explain a little bit about the workflow, how uh, the background to uh, what we do before we get to an inspection. Um, like others have talked about, we have a risk-based approach. When the commencement notices come in, we uh, open files on certain building projects that we think uh, are higher risk. And for those projects, we will send them a Section 11 letter informing them of some documentation that we will want uh, during the building process around parts E, parts F, and parts L. And uh, so at the CCC stage, we'll send a reminder, Section 11, to say that uh, we still want this information. Um, we receive then, uh, the, the technical side of the department will receive an email then from the admin asking us to confirm that there's no unresolved issues with Section 11's, the fire cert, or the DAC. So after undertaking a document review, we'll then go to site uh, and do the inspection with, with those documents uh, in mind. Then we will reply if everything is in order to go ahead and validate the CCC, or if we require further information, then we undertake that process. So just to uh, look a little bit at the Section 11 request that we send, we're looking for um, the test results uh, for Part E, the sound test results as set out in the TGD, um, the Part F, ventilation validation test results, again, as set out in TGD F, and for Part L, we're looking for the air pressure test results, as well as the Part L report to check uh, the EPC, CPC, and RER results. We also, in the Section 11, request uh, the BER certificate, even though that's under different legislation. So in terms of those numbers for the air tightness report, we're looking for a value of five meters cubed per meter squared per hour or less, as set out in, in Part L. The Part L report, we're looking for an energy performance coefficient of 0.3 or less, a carbon performance coefficient of uh, 0.35 or less, and a renewable energy ratio of 0.2 or less. These are all for dwellings. For uh, non-dwellings, there are different numbers um, set out in the other Part L, but a, a similar process. In the Part L report, we'll also check that the minimum U values have been complied with and check that they're using the correct psi value, that they can only use the, the psi value of 0.08 if the uh, approved construction uh, details were adhered to. Uh, for the ventilation validators report, again, we're checking that the, the test results received uh, match the design of the building and the, the square meters or the number of people uh, within a dwelling. And for an MVHR, we'll be checking that the system is balanced, that the supply uh, equals the extract um, or is greater than it, but not more than 15% greater. And then on part E, the test results that we're looking for, um, we want to check that, first of all, they have used the correct table to decide on the number of sets of tests to be done. Um, in some cases, we find that people have used uh, table 3A, but the construction that they're, that they're using is not covered in section 3 or 4 of uh, TGDE. And so we uh, will go back and ask them to do additional tests uh, to meet the requirements in uh, Table 3B. And then for the individual tests themselves, we want to make sure that the airborne uh, test results are greater than 53 decibels and that the impact ones are less than 58 decibels. Um, just to point out that uh, the inspections that we do at CCC stage, it's not a technical assessment. Um, the framework for building control authority says it's not appropriate that a building control authority would uh, begin a technical assessment at this stage. We're just undertaking a visual inspection of what has been built and checking its compliance with the TGD A to M. So what are the things that we really look for in the inspections? Mostly what we're looking at is part B issues and part M issues. So. For fire, we're looking at the windows, the doors, emergency lighting, signage, refuge places. Um, and then for accessibility, we're looking at access routes, stairs, 
door thresholds. We pay particular attention to the toilets and the car parking spaces. So here's some examples of uh, some things that we've seen on site. Here's an example of some intumescent strip, which has dropped out of a, a fire door set. Um, there's a fire door with its plaque missing. And here we're just checking uh, the fire door tag that it uh, matches up with uh, the fire door, the fire certificate, uh, that it's in the correct place, it's the correct uh, type of door, and uh, that it matches up with the ancillary certs that are provided for, for that door set. Another thing we look at is uh, windows. So this is an upstairs window here on the left, with, which has a lock. Um, that needs to be replaced with a push button mechanism um, because upstairs windows should not be lockable. Here we have a, a window which doesn't have a restrictor, so that needs a restrictor to make sure that the window doesn't open more than 100 millimeters, um, but that it can be opened in case of, of need of escape. This is a, a full length window in a shower. This is all the rage in Dunleary now. And uh, I think it needs some restrictors, some guarding, and uh, I don't know, maybe some opaque glass to stop public order offenses uh, happening there. Um, we'll also check the running man strategy, um, that it matches with the fire cert and that it's coherent. Here you can see, uh, you could get confused as to which direction you should go in case of a fire. This one is obviously <coughs> put in backwards and need need to be amended. Um, we spend a lot of time in attics, uh, looking at what's up there. Um, again, with part B, if there's a solar installation, particularly um, if there's a string inverter, um, we want to make sure that it's mounted on a, a fire resistant surface and not mounted on wood. Um, we'll also be checking for the automatic switch so that if the electricity is turned off to the building, that the power coming from the PV panels will also be automatically switched off. A uh, manual switch is no longer uh, allowed. And we'll also check with the Part L report that it matches with what we see on the roof. Uh, sometimes we find that uh, the number of panels on the roof doesn't match what you see in the Part L report, or um, uh, you see that there's no no panels in the Pardell report, but you can see panels on the roof. And sometimes you need to go back and ask them to redo the, the Pardell report and the BR certificate so that they match. Uh, moving on to Part M. Uh, this is an example of uh, poor, poor railings on a, on a duplex. Uh, we have a trip hazard here with the bottom step, not enough guarding, and this railing is not compliant. So. This was the first uh, CCC, and then at the second attempt, uh, much better uh, result. Uh, another issue around steps, which we see, this is at a school, uh, the tactile paving should extend 400 millimeters or, or one, one paving slab to the side of the edge of the steps. So this is before, and this is where they've uh, replaced the, the tactiles afterwards. Another thing we pay particular attention to is thresholds, um, making sure that they are 15 millimeters or less. This is an example in a, a nursing home where the threshold is more than 15 mil. And this is a door that is going to be used by wheelchair users multiple times a day. So it's important that it's got right uh, before the building opens. Another example just of poor quality finishing at an accessible threshold needed to be uh, reset. Another thing we look at is uh, accessible car parking spaces. Um, this one here, it's a, a lovely uh, car parking space, but there's no way to access the pavement. Someone in a wheelchair would actually have to go up the road here and uh, travel to the, the next drop curb, which is about 20 meters up the road. So um, another example at this school, uh, they haven't hatched out the the safe area around the, the car parking space uh, when we visited for the CCC, but this was the, 
this was the picture sent by a science, a science certifier after it being correctly hatched. <coughs> Other things we look for, just general trip hazards, making sure that the site is safe. Um, here, we, we look at toilets quite closely and try to make sure that they comply with diagram 15A and diagram 15B of part M. Uh, in this case, there was no emergency assistance pull cord uh, in this school toilet. Um, again, this is the staff room of a school. Uh, the, the kitchen is not compliant with the ref requirements for refreshment facilities. There should be clear knee access uh, underneath the worktop um, and uh, special taps uh, that are accessible. Um, so that's, uh, again, at CCC stage, this has been uh, set out and the CCC was invalidated, so I had to come back and do it again um, in a few weeks' time. Um, looking at Part L, uh, Part L requires that um, Pipes coming from a hot water vessel are insulated for the first meter. You often see that this is not complied with um, because people believe that it's contributing to the, the heating of the building. On the right, we see uh, good practice. Again, back to the attics um, and the part L issues that, that we see here. The ventilation subcontractor has decided to remove some insulation in order to fit in his CMUV box, um, and so that, that needed to be moved. Um, we quite often see poor placement of insulation, especially th this is an example of where they've done an air tightness test, <coughs> and the penetration here through the air tightness membrane wasn't taped well, so they've come up and they've pulled back the insulation to, to tape this up to improve the air tightness result but nobody has put the insulation back, and we see this quite often. So quite often we're asking our science certifiers to make sure that uh, insulation has been correctly returned um, at the at CCC stage. Other places just find insulation missing, in, in particular elements underneath walkways especially. Um, other part L issues we find around energy controls. So each room should have either a thermostat or a thermostatic radiator valve if, you're, if you have radiators. So in some cases we find uh, radiators without uh, thermostatic radiator valves, um, even when there's no uh, thermostat in the room. Or in some cases we find both a thermostat and a thermostatic radiator valve, which is also non-compliant. We just want one or the other, not both. Um, back into the attic uh, and looking at ventilation issues now. So uh, we want to make sure that all the ducts in the cold attic space are uh, correctly insulated. Um, again, this is a similar situation to the air tightness test. This is now at the ventilation commissioning, commissioning or the validation test stage. Um, these joints needed to be taped. They, they were obviously leaking. So someone has come up, retaped the joints, but has not replaced the insulation afterwards. Um, we also have challenges around use of flexible ducting, and that ducting, when it meets an obstruction like this, it's not able to maintain its cross-sectional area. Um, we also look out for the boost button. Sometimes it's put in uh, inaccessible spaces, including inside the attic. And then finally, uh, we want to make sure that the house owner is able to access the manuals for the equipment that's being put into the house, so the MVHR or the heat pump, for example. Um, we want to make sure that they can get the manual and, for example, spare parts like the filters uh, are available, that they know where to get them. We check that the MVHR has a condensate drain. Sorry and um, that there's no peaks or troughs in the, in the ductwork. Here we see an example of flexible ductwork being used and um, a trough which is likely to collect condensate over time. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you.